Thank you so very much for joining me for this week's program of Connect. My guest today is Richard Mockmore. He is a man who was incarcerated for 18 years, and you will want to connect with him today. Richard's road has not been easy, but he is a man who not only talks the talk, more importantly, he walks the walk. You will connect with him, and you will find out how God saved and changed his life, met him right where he was at. Don't go away. You'll want to connect with Richard in just moments. Thank you so very much for joining me for this week's program of Connect. My guest today is a very special man. Again, he's got a powerful testimony, and you will want to connect with Richard Mockmore. Richard, thank you so very much for joining me on Connect. Thank you for having me. You are so welcome. Well, again, this program is going to be very Holy Spirit-led, and Richard does have a powerful story, and so we're going to let him connect with you. That's what Connect is all about, real people sharing real stories about our real God doing really miraculous things, and God has done really miraculous things in Richard's life. I always start the program with prayer, so would you join me now? Heavenly Father, we come to you through your Son, Jesus, and we are just so thankful to have Richard here today. Heavenly Father, again, his story gives you all the glory, and we know that so many viewers will be touched by his witness, be impacted by his witness, and that they will know, like he has known, that you can turn around a life by your amazing goodness and your amazing grace. Heavenly Father, again, Richard is walking, talking, living, breathing proof that, um, again, no person is too low for you to reach down and save. And again, we just are so thankful that Richard is here today. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to start by reading a passage of scripture, and I asked Richard for that, and he um, directed me to Matthew 25, starting in verse 31. And Jesus is talking, and he says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate them as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Well, my friends, Richard was in prison for 18 years, and again, um, God really saved and changed his life during that time. And again, he is one that now just doesn't talk the talk, but really walks the walk. And we were talking about that before we started this week's program of Connect. So, Richard, I would just like to have you open the program by um, giving people kind of an a overall view of what your life was like before that imprisonment. And then we'll really get into that prison time. And then we'll devote the last part of the show to really what God is doing through your life now, because it is a powerful witness that does give God all the glory. So let's talk about Richard before prison. Richard before prison was a hate-filled, angry man, an alcoholic who started drinking at the age. I was basically drinking as a baby because I used to put alcohol on my gums when I was teething at six months old. And I got a taste for it. And by the time I was 10, I was already drinking. By the time I was 15, I'd already went through 11 foster homes, four institutions. I was weighing 265, 270 pounds. I was a big kid. I hated life, I hated anybody, and I was always in trouble. 
and uh, a juvenile court judge stepped in at 16 and said, well, you know what? You're a big boy. You're a man. You want to act like a man. You are a man. And with the stroke of a pen, he placed me in the U.S. Marine Corps. Talk about a world of difference in life. Tell us about that. Um, a radical change from, <laughs> from making um, very poor decisions on your own to a very structured environment as a Marine. At first, I really jumped into it. I loved it. I mean, uh, my God, I'm 265 pounds. I'm fat, but muscle. And they started convincing me I could believe in myself. Amen. They, you know, that with a team approach, you can do anything. You can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. But you've got to have it here. Mm -hmm. You've got to want mm -hmm. So that was the start of some things. I got in, I did pretty well, but then after basic and then going from a couple of different places and being in different areas, I started drinking again. And well, back then too, if you remember right, uh, the legislature decided, oh, well, our 18 year olds can drink. Let's give them the right to drink and we're gonna give them the right to drink. Oh man, that was letting the cat out of the bag. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of my downfall. Ended up, uh, my CO said something I didn't like. I punched him out and I was thrown out. Thrown out of the Marines? Yep. So then where did you go? Uh, bounced around, got myself in some trouble in Florida, did some prison time there. Thought I had it all under control, thought I was going to do all right. Well, God was putting people in my plat path planting seeds. Yeah, amen. Did you know it at the time, Richard? No. Yeah, you didn't have a clue. I uh, didn't have a clue. Uh, matter of fact, it's not only the people in this community that had an impact, in this state that had an impact, but there's been people all across the United States from Florida to Texas to Virginia to South Carolina. There's even one man in particular in Canada that's had an effect because of his story. Mm -hmm. And isn't that just God? Um, he knows right where you're at at all times and he sees the choices you're making and maybe the wrong paths you're going down. And all throughout your life, Richard, God was putting people in your pathway that were, again, planting and watering seeds into your soil. I was just too hard-headed to see it. <laughs> right. And that's typical. That's very typical. Um, ultimately, got out of prison out of Florida, did my time, got involved with a group out in Washington State, thought I had my life together. Um, problems with my family, but that's that's par for the course. Um, I still love my family. Don't misunderstand me. I love them. I care about them. But, uh, you know, we all make choices and we have to live with them, mm -hmm. whether we want to or not. Mm -hmm. It's our decisions and our choices that we make that affect other people. And had I known as many people as I affected with the choices I made and the destruction that I wrought, <laughs> did I mess up? I just hope and pray that I didn't in that destruction and turmoil and that somebody didn't ultimately pay the ultimate cost because of my stupidity and my insanity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell us about how God has worked through those family situations. Are they better now? Well, I saw my brother for the first time since 1985. I saw him last year. We spent two days together and he didn't drink one time during the time we were together. And at the time, we didn't know whether 
the minute we saw each other, we were going to go like we always did, and that's cats and dogs, and try to kill each other. It didn't happen. God was in that. Um, I connected with a sister who I hadn't seen in many years. Um, unfortunately, Alzheimer's has got her, and we're going to be losing her, I'm afraid, soon. And so God has done some, some big restoration in those family, yep. in that family brokenness. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is it perfect? No. No, no, no family is, Richard. No family is. Uh, do we have a ways to go? Yes. Can we get there? I believe so with the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit. I think we can do all things through Christ. Amen, amen, amen. Tell us about those 18 years in prison. Um, and again, um, the impact that God had on you during that time. Most people have uh, never known probably someone who has spent time in jail, uh, let alone for that long. So tell us what life was like and, and how uh, you received the Lord. And again, how that literally, literally turned your life around. You know, prison is not much different than society. The only difference is it's smaller. Uh, most of my time was combined within, confined within 40-foot walls that were 20-foot thick at the base with a 16-foot top at the center and armed guard towers all around it. Um, Prison has a society system just like society outside. You have your high, high ups, your wealthy ones who are considered in, in prison. It's usually your cop killers, murderers, the ones that have made a big name for themselves and taken a lot of people. Then you have your bank robbers and your robbers, your home invasion people, then you have your people that write bad checks and some write them for hundreds of thousands of dollars and you know, that's pretty good. Oh, you're smart. Well, if you're so smart, how, how'd you get caught? I ought to know. I was a check writer myself. I wasn't that smart. But uh, then you have your which, uh, when you get to the bottom of the rung, you have your rapists and then you have your pedophiles. And it's just a tier system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not who you know, but it's who you have with you and who's protecting you. What, who you hang with can make all the things any different in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us about meeting God in prison. <laughs> Boy, did it take him a long time to get me. <laughs> it started in 1996, Labor Day weekend. Before that, in June, uh, May, June of 96, there was a thing going around, and it was come to the CEW weekend, which is Christian Experience Weekend. And uh, you had to sign up for it. You got to get. You had to get approved from not only your chaplain. You had to get approved from the corrections team, security. It, it's a. It was a drawn process. And the CEW was men who gave up their time with their families and their jobs to come in and visit men like me who came in to share their faith, their hope, and their witness. Amen. How often did they come, Richard? They came once a year, and then other times you would see them come in and do a, the, the members of the Archdiocese of Dubuque Jail and Prison Ministry, especially Deacon Beaver, Bill Beaver, he would come in and do masses for the guys. And at the time, I didn't know who I was, what I was. I was an angry, ticked off man who could not believe that God was going to allow me to do 35 years. And I hated God. I hated anything about God. But yet, 
I still kept going back to church. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can figure that out, I don't know. Well, I. God was drawing you and, and, and knew that, that you belonged to him and was drawing you to him. When I first went to the first CEW, the, one of the first men I met was Deacon Bill Beaver. Then I met Father George Karnak. And the third person and fourth person were. At the time, he was the police chief of Dubuque, John Moss, active police chief. And he's walking into a prison. Mm, 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 that's amazing. And then we had an active parole probation officer who was a deacon that walked into the prison. Amen. And like you said, these guys are taking their time and, and, and from their families and those kind of things and spending that weekend to really um, meet you right where you were at and, and to pour into you and plant into you and give you a hope in, in the Lord. They would come in at, after six o'clock count Friday night. We would all load our mattresses and whatever we could take and we'd walk across the yard carrying them to the gymnasium where they would lock us in at night. And guys could get real cruel. There was a lot of cruel things said. Some people reacted differently and then other guys were judgmental and well we know why they're doing what they're doing and you know they're just some were in it for the game, some were in it trying to get uh, special, you know, trying to figure out some way they could scam the system to get an early out and stuff. Me, my original intention was to go in and to be quite honest with you, I was going to challenge them because I thought I had all the faith in the world and look what God did to me. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't crack them. Mm -hmm. I couldn't crack them, I couldn't touch them. Do you remember what kind of um, challenges you gave to them? Do you remember something that you said, Richard, that, and, the, and the response that they had? Yeah, explain to me why I'm doing pr prison time and why you guys tell me I need to forgive. Why should I? And they would look at me with their eyes and they'd look right in my eyes and say, because Jesus forgave you. Amen. And he loves you, and you still need to love them. Amen. And forgiveness is a hard thing. Um, but I always say, Richard, that, that God commands us to forgive, and he gives us the grace to do it. And because we have been forgiven by him, then, then we um, can follow in his footsteps and forgive others. I've all often heard the expression, my grandfather used to quote it quite a bit, you can forgive all you want, but you never will forget. But I'm finding, and as much as I love my grandfather, he was wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because you can forgive all you want with words, mm -hmm. but until the action of forget mm -hmm. comes into play, you never can and truly Forget. That's very that's very wise, Richard. And again, God forgives and God forgets, doesn't he? I mean, he forgives all of our sins and he forgets all of our sins. As far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your sins and transgressions. So again, he tells us that, that we can do the same thing. And, and through the power of the Holy Spirit living within us, we can. And we just have to open up our heart um, to be in a position where, where we want to allow that most beautiful act of love to be given. Without his love and without the men and the people within this community and elsewhere who not only talk to talk, and there's thousands of us, I was one, I talked to talk all day long. But when it came time to walk that walk, I always had something better to do. I always took the time. I never took the time to really get it. You can talk all day long, but unless you walk it, it's 
it's for naught mm -hmm. because my another saying my grandfather and my stepfather always said was actions speak louder than all the words that come out of your mouth mm -hmm. and for me actions the act of giving love freely mm, amen. of forgiving freely amen. of allowing Jesus to live in me freely mm. it's them actions that allow me to be the man that I am today amen. a changed man a changed man, a Holy Spirit filled man, a man of God, a man of love, a man of grace and truth and forgiveness. And again, uh, for someone sitting out there watching, Richard, there's a lot of people that struggle with unforgiveness in their heart. And, and I really believe that, that you seeing Richard and, and hearing his testimony um, can open up your heart to know that, that if there is unforgiveness in your heart, you can uh, forgive whoever has hurt you. However bad it's been, you can forgive. And Richard is living proof of that. Richard, I want to talk, uh, I don't want to leave this out, so I really want to get this in about your work now with a very important mission right here in Dubuque. Um, again, and let's talk about what's going on at St. John's. And, and um, we did a Connect program earlier about what is happening at St. John's, so some of our viewers might remember that. But let's talk about what God is doing, using you to do at St. John's. And, and, and let's talk about really what that is all about. <laughs> Lord, help me. <laughs> St. John's, as some of you may know and may remember, um, Pastor Jay Yilton touched base with uh, Executive Director Rick Mim of the Dubuque Rescue Mission. There was men being on the streets last year. Well, Pastor Jay went back to the church board and said, look, can we do something? So the church board said yes. We'll put six beds down in the basement, and we'll do what we can. St. John's opened its doors on December 2nd with one man. Last year, is that correct? Last year. Right. In the preceding months, from December 2nd to March 31st of 2012, we provided 450 beds. We touched the lives of 68 men and one woman. Eight of them men are now today, four of them are here in this community that are now working. They are doing what they need to do for their lives and their self-sufficient self-sufficient and God has really blessed us uh, we started with nothing the fire department found out about us and they come in and said nope you got to put in a fire a sprinkler system a hard wire smoke alarm system you got 30 days no way I remember doing that interview, Richard, because it was thousands of dollars. And again, you had a very short time span to get that money raised. $150,000 was what they estimated the cost at. Um, last Sunday, by church vote, and they're talking with the contractors now. We are going to be going forward. We are installing the sprinkler okay. system. Okay. We are installing the smoke alarm system. We've been blessed with tremendous, tremendous response from the community. Uh, we've been applying for grants. We have received one grant of $20,000, but the money has to be spent before we get it back. But right now we're looking between our low was, I believe, somewhere in the neighborhood of 53000 for the complete construction and stuff. And they did change some things requirements because at the time they didn't know we had met some of them requirements and other things uh, that uh, 
our low bid, we were looking in the neighborhood of, I believe it was 58 to 60,000 to 75,000 dollars. And depending on the fluctuation with the contractors, I'm not involved in that part of it. But we now have in hand enough to finish that. That is so Operating good. budget, no. Right. It's all based on volunteer. And talk about Richard, how, again, I can only imagine how God is using you and your past experience to really minister to those men who, who come and need that bed and, and um, you know, that, that, that word of wisdom and that, the fact that you've been down a very hard road yourself. When they come in, the first thing I say to them is, look, this is a gift from God. Mm -hmm. Use it wisely. Mm -hmm. If you want a hand up, this is the place you want to be. Mm -hmm. I had a different saying otherwise, but I, I cut that out. But if you're looking for a hand out, please don't hang around. Right. Because I there's too many lives. People need that help. Mm -hmm. And until they get it here, mm -hmm. in their, they can have all the knowledge in, the work, in your right. head. Right. But you've got to get it in your gut and in your heart. If you don't have it, that you know that you're at the lowest of the low, and you don't have enough respect and dignity for yourself, right. how can I or you or anyone else give it to you? We can't. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah, that's very well said. If you're looking for a hand up, then this is the place to be. If you're looking for a hand out, then, then this is not the place to be. And again, it is all about empowering uh, men who are at their lowest, believe in themselves, and know that God has a good plan for their life. Um, Richard, I do just want you to look right in the camera and close this show. We've only got a few seconds left, but give someone out there who is in a very um, dark time in their life and, and going through um, a lot of, of turmoil. Um, they may feel like they're in prison emotionally. Give them a word of encouragement right now, would you? What I can say to you from my life experience is this. If you surrender, if you let it go and let God have it, He will take it, He will see you through, Amen. and He will meet you. But you have to. Let God. Amen. Beautifully spoken, let go and let God. So I do believe that there's people out there right now who have issues in their life and, and you've been carrying that baggage way too long and it's way too heavy of a burden. Let go and let God. And be like Richard, a man who has been set free by the grace and the goodness of Jesus Christ. I'll see you next week for another program of Connect.